the new academic year in extension here. Uh, our team, the Learning Engagement Office, probably everybody who knows them, um, Amanda and Kim, and Alex is in the back, and, and myself. So, uh, welcome, um, Chrissy Schultz, you are the Assistant Dean, academic from the Faculty of Extension is here to give us some welcoming greetings. So, thank you. Thanks, Brian. Um, and thank you all for coming to, uh, this evening to take in this session, this uh, fall kickoff. Um, I just want to take a quick moment to acknowledge that uh, tonight's event is being hosted on Treaty 6 territory. Um, and it's something that um, I realize I only have begun to learn and embrace um, in the last decade. And so I, it's a privilege to work and learn um, on Treaty 6 territory uh, alongside all of you. Um, I also want to um, offer a special thanks to Brian, as well as uh, Amanda, Kim, and Alex for putting on this evening. Um, the Faculty of Extension couldn't do the work that we do without them. Of course, I uh, cannot forget that the Faculty of Extension can't do any of the wonderful work we do within our uh, continuing and professional education programs, our English language school, and our graduate program without instructors like yourselves. Um, and I'm personally grateful that all of you are here to engage in the learning as well as to uh, continue your teaching activities um, uh, with all of us and for all of our students. Um, when I hear about the highlights of courses, um, it's often their experiences they have with instructors. So, um, so thank you. Um, uh, I think just before uh, turning things over to Kim, um, it looks like there's, at least for me, a, a couple of new faces in the room. Um, so, okay, one new face in the room, I'm realizing. Um, <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. No pressure. Uh, but for me, but for all of you, there might be some other new faces in the room. So I just want to take a quick second to ask you to just introduce yourself and which course uh, that you're teaching or what courses that you teach. And then when there's more networking at the end, you'll know who everyone is. How that Sure. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Kyle Whitfield, and I teach um, a course called Citizen Engagement and Consultation. It's an e-class course, and there are about uh, 75 students in the, in the class. It's a required course for, for several certificates. Yeah. Hello, my name is Devraj Hanza, and, and I teach a Global Leadership and Cultural Experience course. That's an e-class course. Uh, comes under Advanced Citation of Hi, I'm Rebecca Anderson, and I'm a new program assistant in communication and design. So I tried to get some of my instructors out here, but just taking it in so that I know a bit more about you know, and just help assist my instructors there. Yeah, you'll get a, a first-hand experience of some of the wonderful things that can be offered to your instructors. So thank you for being here. My name is Mary Becky. I'm uh, an academic here in the faculty, and I teach both at the graduate level and uh, involved with. Master of Arts in Community Engagement. And then my other hat is uh, teaching within the NACLA program, National Advanced Certificate for Local Government Authority or something local like that. Local Authority Administration. Yeah, Local Authority Administration. <laughs> and the course I teach, uh, it's uh, another one like Kyle's uh, course is also part of this program. And my course is called Sustainable Community. I'm Don Mori, and I teach in the Residential Institute. I'm Rebecca Lowe. I am also a program assistant in communications and design. So Go communications and design. Yeah. yeah, so you can actually just email Rebecca <coughs> and get you know, someone who can help you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait. Well, you'll introduce yourself in more detail. Uh, my name is David Yak. Um, I teach in, oh, let's see here. Uh, well, business analytics, uh, business analysis, project management, change management, supervisory development. And I used to do IT management as well. Unfortunately, why does the world not need IT management? Yeah, I just need safety too. I used to do some safety. But, yeah. <laughs> but not anymore. No, no, no. no. We can't well, let it be. We can't let it be. We can't let it be. My name is Tim Reddit. Uh, I am the new uh, incident investigation. I'm 
I love this classroom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm Bill Roy. I'm the excuse me, manager of HR for the city of Central. So guess who class of night? <laughs> Human Resource Foundation, Labor and Employee Relations, Negotiations, and I also uh, am the Strategy of Personal Communication. And some leadership courses in communication. So great. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Daryl Rufus. I teach uh, Senator Neal with the Individual Program of HR, the Advanced HR Course, uh, Workforce Planning Course. I'm Ellen Madu. I'm with the Dean's Office. So if you want to spend more time with Helen, all you have to do is identify plagiarists in your class. And you sing out with her. Yes, thank you. The work that you do in preparing instructors for course for students who violate the code. It is invaluable. Thank you. And thank you all. Um, uh, so without further ado, um, you are going to have the opportunity to engage in lifelong learning yourself this evening. And first up will be uh, Kim Wardrop, who's going to tell you a little bit about um, the variety of services that the Learning Engagement Office offers. Um, and Kim has been here for two years, or nearly two years, and herself is also engaged in lifelong learning and, and has signed up for a class this term. So all the learning. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I was going to open with the land acknowledgement, so thank you for doing that, actually. Uh, fun tidbit, something that you've started to notice maybe in the last few years that people start doing at the beginning of meetings or gatherings, but it's actually been a practice that First Nations groups have done for thousands and thousands of years, and I only just learned this not too long ago. So it's really cool just to engage in that tradition and kind of think a little bit more about where you are and how lucky we are to get that. So instead of a land uh, acknowledgement, yeah. yes? Share. Instead of a land acknowledgement, where's my share screen? Stop sharing? Aha, sharing the screen. I'm going to touch on what Christy said about uh, the code of student conduct. You need to get screen to share. I'm getting it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's really important for you at the beginning of your term to go over that uh, code of student behavior with your students. So even if you just teach online on eClass, send a little post being like, reminder here students, here's some key things about that, you can read the whole thing here, so on and so forth. Please keep doing the amazing work that you do. So like Christy said, I'm Kim Wardrop and I'm an e-learning support specialist. So you've probably seen emails from me before saying, hey, your e-class is ready or here's some different things that we can do with e-class. Oh my God, am I still messing up, Alex? A little bit. <laughs> You're so close. I'm so close. <laughs> and I'm supposed to be a support for e-class. <laughs> I had to click that button. Okay, now we're good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now good. We're in the recording. Yeah, that'll be something that everyone can laugh about for ages to come. <laughs> Great. Uh, so tonight what I'm going to talk a little bit about is who exactly we are and how you can use our services as well as um, what our operations look like within the faculty. How do our cogs fit in everywhere else? So by the end of this presentation, you're going to know roughly what our mission is. Uh, I don't expect you to recite it word for word, but I am going to test you on it. So just kind of get a general idea of one of these points. Like, okay, what are these people here for? And like I said, how do we fit in with the operations with the rest of what does it do and how do we help out everyone else? And finally, you're going to know how you can use our services. So you might know us for building eClass, but we do a lot more than that behind the scenes. So we're going to touch a little bit upon what we're doing elsewhere. So our mission, which is brand new, we just made this over the summer because we always knew what we cared about and what we stood for, but we didn't have a solid unified purpose that we all got on board with. 
So through adult education design and development, the Learning Engagement Office creates and supports an exceptional teaching and learning environment at the Faculty of Extension. So that touches on three things. We're here to support you, your students, and we also engage in lifelong learning and educational design, which is actually one of the more fun parts of our job, I think. I really like it when someone says, hey, can you make a rubric for this thing? And I kind of like geek out a little bit. <laughs> So below our mission statement is our master email, which I have written on the board too, and I'm going to throw it at you like eight more times before I'm done tonight. This is a really good place to start a conversation with us, even if Alex is supporting your course or Amanda. If you email their, their email address and they're away at another meeting or on vacation, they're not going to get it. But if you go to leolearn at uoberta.ca, all of us are in on there and we watch it like a hawk. One of us will be able to give you the support that you need in a timely manner. And here are our lovely portraits. There's the four of us. Our fearless leader, Brian Brawl, is on the right, and he just took over being our instructional designer. So if you're making a new course or making improvements to it, he's going to be the guy that you deal with. And our senior e-learning specialist is Amanda. She runs a tight ship and she keeps Alex and I in order, makes sure that we get our homework done on time. <laughs> and of course, Alex and I take on a lot of the e-class build. So I'd say like 98% of courses that are offered in extension, we build those e-classes. We share a little bit with Amanda too, but you know, as mother brain, she's got to make sure everything else is running smoothly too. <laughs> So I wanted to go over our structure. What does it look like exactly day to day in our operations? So if this is a brand new course that you're a part of, it's never existed before, the program office will hire a subject matter expert, so someone who's uh, really uh, like a master in their field, and they'll pair that person up with our instructional designer, who currently is Brian. Where they go through some of the key elements that are going to be necessary for a course and what are some of the things that they want to see in students by the end of that course. That process can take anywhere from a couple months to what's the longest project you've ever seen? Six months. Uh -huh. Depending on how heavy it is. So that's for a new course. Now once it's complete or for a course that already exists, the program office first starts by hiring instructors. So they go out and they look for you and they pair you up with the courses that they want to offer. After that, they've decided what courses they're going to offer that semester, what instructors they have, how many students that they have in each course. They say, okay, here's our list of stuff and they throw it on over to Amanda. And Amanda curates this whole list of everything that's being offered at the Faculty of Extension for what term. And then she breaks up those jobs between the three of us. So who's going to build what course this term? And it's all randomized by term. She likes to make sure that we get to touch a little bit of everything so that we get in contact with everyone at least once every year or so. And after we've built that course, Brian and ourselves are in constant contact with you to give you support and make sure that you're and everything's running okay in your e-class to see if there's anything else that you might need. And while we're doing that, we're also doing e-class environmental scans. And what I mean by that is we take a look at how you're teaching your course and we identify any areas where, oh, hey, if you try this tool, it might make your life easier. We're always looking for ways to save you on time because being an instructor takes a whole lot of time. So if there's any tool that we can use to help you get things done quicker, we always are looking out for that and letting you know. So beyond e-class, there's a lot of other things that are going on during the year. And of course, one of those things is professional development, as you can see right now. So we're always thinking, um, what do instructors need from us and what do they want from us? So some of you may have received that survey in the spring about, okay, what was your impression this year? What would you like to see next year? Thank you to those of you who filled it out. It was very helpful. And it's kind of informing some of the changes that we're making in the upcoming year, such as time of day that we offer these things. 
We're also responsible for writing and publishing, putting out the instructor handbook. So this is available as a print copy and also online. And it's just a book to give you a picture of how Extension operates, who are the contacts that you can get in touch with for various needs, and other hints and tips that you might not know that you get to enjoy and take advantage of as an instructor with the University of Alberta. We are also part of video editing. This is something that's relatively new too. So the marketing team has gotten in contact with some of you to kind of explain what your courses are or your programs. And then they send the video uh, footage to us, and we get to turn it into a minute and a half video. So we've made about 20 or so so far. Um, and they've turned out really good. They've actually really increased our engagement with some of the student body. So if you haven't done that yet, and you're kind of interested, you're like, oh, I'd like to actually make a video, then get in touch with us or your program office, and we will get you an appointment and set you up with the right people. Not to toot my own horn or anything, but I make them look good. So if you want to look good, <laughs> record a video. We've also been working on micro-learning packages. So one of the things that we heard from instructors is, I want to be able to practice certain e-class things on my own time when I need them. So uh, it's not quite ready yet, but I'm hoping within the next few months we're going to release our own e-class that you can self-enroll into and go through a bunch of little self-guided lessons just to practice some of the common e-class uh, tools and tricks that you might use while you're teaching your course. We are also looking to include other things in there, like teaching practices, how to make your PowerPoint notes look professional, or tips on improving your public speaking. So look for that in the next couple months. We're going to let you know when it's available, and hopefully the enrollments pour in. I touched upon this already, but we always keep our eye on how can we make this e-class even better. So usually over the summer when things kind of calm down a bit and the big e-class updates are put in, we take a look at what the environment looks like now and we say, okay, what do we need to change and what might actually work better for instructors this upcoming year? And we make sure to let you know about that too. But perhaps most importantly, one of the biggest thing that we do that's going on all the time is instructor and staff support. And that's the one that we really like the most. When someone comes in and they're like, hey, I'd like some help or I'd like to learn something new, we kind of lose our mind. We get really excited about that. And it's an ongoing thing. People can just knock on our door or give us a phone call or email us and we welcome them in and we spend some time with you. So if that sounds like something you want to try, just drop on by or just send us an email and we'll set up something. All right, so how can you use Leo? Obviously, we're here for e-class help. Like I said, that's what we're most known for. So throughout the year, we're building your e-courses, and we're making sure that everything's working the way it should. We're updating some materials for some of you, and we're making sure that students get the help that they need if they run into any roadblocks. We're doing course improvements, as I've mentioned. So that involves, all right, um, for example, one of our instructors, really likes the use of quiz analytics within eClass. And if you didn't know that that was a thing, especially for multiple choice question tests, eClass collects data on what questions are people getting right and wrong most often, where are the high indicators and low indicators, what questions probably need to be revamped, and which ones are really strong for figuring out who knows their stuff. Uh, so that's one that we do quite often. It was actually a really handy tool. Teaching strategy. So um, I don't know if anyone's come in for a while, but if you're a new teacher in particular, we have people come in to talk to our instructional designer or any of us because we do have education backgrounds. Just for any teaching strategies and new tips or something to help improve your face-to-face -face instruction or your online instruction. So we've got quite a wealth of knowledge in that office. And we also happen to be technology experts as well. So I put an asterisk by that because we're not quite IST support. So if you're having problems with your printer or you can't log into your Gmail account, we can't exactly help you out with that. But if you want to improve on the way that you use your Gmail account or anything like that, we can help you with that too. So another funny story, we actually, uh, one of us was sitting with a program assistant the other day and this program assistant was trying to find this one specific email and just kept clicking on that one. No, not that one. No, not that one. And she was getting frazzled. And Amanda, 
what it said. Have you heard of Conversation View? It makes all of the emails that are related to one topic available right there so that you can see it all at once. And this person was like, I didn't know you could do that. Revolutionized her world. Her job is now a lot more easy to do. So things like that, we kind of have an eye for, oh, I noticed you're doing this. Have you considered this? And if there's anything that you want to consult on, like, let me show you how I'm operating. Is there anything I can do better? Come let us know. So other things that we offer you are our website. Like I've mentioned, I've written it up here too. I'm really proud of this website because I came into this job not knowing how to code anything and together we actually built this website by hand, which was really fun. And on it you're going to find a lot of how-to articles and other resources that can help you do your job on e-class or just as a teacher in general. Of course, there's always the email address, leolearn at ualberta.ca. If I didn't say it enough, it's leolearn at ualberta.ca. This is the best way to get in touch with us, start a conversation, and set up a meeting. Like I said, we're always watching this address. If you send it to us, someone will see it within a couple of minutes. You can give us a phone call. And I say by request simply because we all have different phone numbers. So if you are like, I would prefer to talk about this over the phone, can we chat? Then we can give you our phone number and we can set up a time that you can call. And of course, you can drop by in person, uh, 8.30 to 4.30, Monday to Friday. So we are behind a closed door simply because of security reasons we can't prop it open. But you can come by and knock if you are in the area. And if you really do want to meet in person, but 8.30 to 4.30 is just not simply possible for you, get in touch with us by the email anyway, and we'll do what we can to meet you halfway and make sure you get the service that you need. And just to reiterate, uh, all of us are educators and technology specialists. And I like to think we all identify as philanthropists, just lovers of humanity. We really care about supporting you. And we really like it when you want to come and get support from us. And just to you know, play on the joke, we are a pride of lions. And we want to include you in our lion family. You didn't know I was going to put that in there, did you? We actually all have like little lion statues at our desk. <laughs> all right, so this is where the testing comes in. So I hope you were paying attention. <laughs> so now, in general, you kind of know what Leo's mission is. So just to get a feel from the audience, roughly, what is it that Leo stands for? Right. <laughs> that is the literal translation, what Leo stands for. <laughs> so why are we here? What is it we want to do? That's pretty good. Learners and instructors. Yeah, we're here to support learners and instructors. We actually really, really like to do that. Thank you. Using education pedagogy. Yeah, and we're all about pedagogy, or andragogy. We talk about that a lot. <laughs> um, what our operations look like? So again, I don't expect you to memorize that complicated chart with all the arrows that I had up there. But in general, what's your impression of how we operate? Leo will take a look at uh, new programs, rebuilding existing programs, and analytics of the evaluation of all of our courses. Yeah, that's a lot of what we do. combination of subject matter experts, designers, and the technology staff. Perfect, Sandy. Man, you're on the ball. They, I knock on their door. <laughs> <laughs> they they do say hello, Sandra, and they roll their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, 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 they do that to me. Oh, <laughs> oh, I, I feel better now. Oh, Kyle's at the door. <laughs> Does anyone else have anything to add? Their impression of how we operate? Obviously, it sounds like major support and flexibility. Yeah, I like to think so. <laughs> well, and you've delegated responsibilities according to your skills and expertise, I guess, as well. That's right. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to say it's top down, but it's more uh, a collaborative. 
to say, but with everybody having their own special rule. That's right. And very friendly people. Yeah. Oh, we paid her to say that. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're bribing you. <clears throat> oh, yeah, thanks everybody. Sounds like you got a pretty good handle on what we are. And just show some examples that you learned today. How can you use Leo? To develop videos. Yeah. <laughs> that's one of my favorite things right now. And you can, help, you can make us look really good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even better than we already are. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> That's what you said. Yeah. <laughs> there some resources for teaching strategies. Yes, we have a lot of those. Absolutely. Navigating through the class when all the ropes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's. Uh, I did bring the e-class progression chart with me today, and it's at most of your tables. And it kind of just gives you an example of what kind of skills do you have as a beginner, and where can you go as an advanced user, and that's some of the things that we can show you. So just as an example, that a lot of people use eClass, but they're just skimming the surface, and there's a whole bunch of tools in there that you may not have even known existed. Thank you for bringing that up, Mary. Awesome. Testing done. Don't want to stress you out too much. You're the instructors, not the students. This is our family. Uh, that uh, person in the middle is Diane Janes, who was our instructional designer, but she has left to go teach at SAIT, or work at SAIT, I should say. So I just put that up because the other day, a couple of my coworkers said, that's such a lovely picture, we should post it somewhere. So I thought I would share that kind of family vibe with you. And there is all of our contact information again. Did I, did I mention LeoLearn at yoberta.ca? Leo Learn at uoberta.ca. Yes. One more time. <laughs> One more time. One more time. Yeah, sorry, sorry. It's Leo Learn at uoberta.ca. <laughs> and of course, our, our website for all of our resources is found at the bottom, ext-leo.ca. We wanted to make it really easy for people to find. And we're located at 2410 in this building, which is at the top of the down escalators on this side. So if you're taking the LRT and go straight up, you'll come right to us. Before I pass it off to Amanda for a brief uh, e-class walkthrough, does anyone have any questions for me? I think the, those videos, um, are those just posted on the different program sites there? Or how do, how do people access them? How do, how do students access those? Uh, we have a YouTube channel that the marketing team oh, okay. um, oversees, and I do believe that they put it on some of the web pages of the program oh, site. Okay. <laughs> you guys know everything. You don't need to ask me questions. Thank you for your time. And now here is Amina. Oh, where's that? Oh, Brett. Okay, so I apologize in advance. Um, I am doing a bit of an e-class tour slash giving you um, some e-class essentials. So I will be looking at the screen because I actually have to click on things uh, every now and then. Um, is there anybody in the room that does not use e-class or has never heard of e-class? This is a good thing. Okay. Um, so e-class is um, the University of Alberta's um, learning management system. And it is a great way, it's basically a dedicated course space where instructors can um, engage with their students in interactions. Um, you can provide instructional materials, things like lecture slides, uh, links to videos, things like that. Um, you can um, set up assignment drop boxes, the list kind of goes on. Um, there are a massive number of things that you can actually do in eClass, but I've only got about 10 minutes or so. Um, so we're just going to run through kind of some of the uh, essential bits. Um, those things that I really think are going to help you as instructors kind of on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're not going to go into a lot of detail on anything per se, but I, I really want everyone to kind of leave knowing that some of these features exist. Uh, and a lot of you um, are already familiar with eClass, so some of this might be review, uh, but having said that, it'll also be an excellent reminder on some of the things that are really uh, key to use. 
And if you're relatively new to eClass, it's actually a really great place to start. Um, we can start you here, get comfortable, and then as you are more comfortable in eClass, we can kind of scaffold you up into some of those um, more advanced features that Kim was talking about with that eClass progression chart um, on your tables. So I'm just going to pop uh, into my course here. So one of the very first things that I wanted to talk about was how to utilize uh, the, e the built-in eClass tours. So the first time that you come into a section on eClass, you will be prompted um, to go through a tour. And I absolutely recommend that you do take the few minutes to kind of go through that, as it'll definitely highlight some of those really key features that you want to pay attention to. If it's been a while since you have gone through one of those tours, um, there is a way to reset it. So I just kind of want to show you what that looks like here. So if you scroll down to the bottom of whatever page it is that you're working on, uh, you'll see that there is a reset user tour on this page link. So if you click on that, um, you will essentially start the eClass tour that is very specific to this particular context. So there will be links here. Um, individual places on the screen will be highlighted along with a tooltip. And it basically just goes along and gives you some important information about each of those sections um, in eClass. Whenever you feel like you're good, um, you can continue through the rest of the tour or you can end it kind of whenever uh, you like and you could always restart it again um, if you choose to do so. So the other thing that I kind of want to show you, um, when you go into your course, you're going to have a very similar look and feel to this and that's because to all of our extension courses, we do apply somewhat of a template. So at the top of your course, you'll always have um, some important course information. You'll always have the instructor information listed at the very top of the page, which makes it really easy for students to know how to contact the instructor, how to ask the questions. Um, there will always be a link to the syllabus, uh, as well as the announcements forum here on the side. Um, on the right hand side, there will always be a series of blocks as well. So the first one here um, will have program information. So if students have questions about kind of registration in the program or you know, kind of what courses are offered. There's the contact information there. Um, there's also a link to the Extension Student Learning Resources site, which um, actually is a subset of our ext slash or hyphen leo.ca uh, address. Uh, the cool thing about this is this part of this website is for students, part of it is for instructors. So if you as an instructor are also looking for things like eClass supports, uh, you just have to toggle over to the instructor side and you'll have access to a, a huge wealth of information there. Um, further down the page here, um, again, Leo Learn at uAlberta.ca, just in case you didn't already get that. Um, there will always be a calendar, and there's a course management block uh, in the course as well. So the course management block will um, basically display the dates that eClass will open for students. Uh, so in this particular case, it opened a long time ago. Um, this I've overridden this sense, but essentially um, it will display the opening and closure date for students in the class. You as an instructor will always have access to your eClass section for its lifetime um, on the system. So that's really going to be um, a really helpful piece uh, in terms of getting you familiarized and comfortable uh, with the interface. Um, and that's kind of the tour piece. Um, any questions about that part? And of course, uh, you always have access to the Leo team, so if there's anything that you ever need kind of a refresher on, um, you can absolutely get in touch with us. Yeah? Uh, two questions, it might be silly, but is there um, one, like, does using iOS or Microsoft, like, will it affect the way no. functions? Yeah, so um, eClass is entirely browser-based, um, so the only real thing that we recommend is that you're using either Google Chrome or Firefox. Um, things like Internet Explorer, or I guess that's actually old now, so Edge, um, you can use them, but we don't recommend them because there are some features in eClass that might not necessarily work as well. Yeah. So I myself always use Chrome, uh, but Firefox is another one that is recommended. Yeah. Okay. So if you make an announcement, does that go directly to the students or do they have to access the announcement? So that's actually a perfect segue because that is what I'm talking about next. Right. So um, the announcements um, is one of the uh, one of the standard pieces that you'll see um, in every course. Um, and if you literally use eClass for nothing else, um, I definitely recommend at least posting your course syllabus and use the announcements forum. 
So the announcements forum is a really fantastic way to get really important information out to your students. So whether it's some sort of notice, kind of saying, hey, you know, class is now in this room instead of this room for whatever reason, um, or if you want to follow up on something that you posted or something that you talked about in class, you know, those kinds of things. Um, even if you are already making verbal announcements um, in class, it's still a really great way to kind of reiterate those things that are really, really important. And I say that for two reasons. So the first reason, um, by putting it into um, e-class, um, any student who is not able to make class doesn't miss out on those really important announcements. Um, and secondly, it kind of provides for a bit of a paper trail. So you can refer students back to that um, if you need to. So you're, if you run into a case where, where a student's kind of saying, oh, well, I didn't know about that, you can kind of refer them back to, um, back to the announcements form. So I'm going to quickly touch base, uh, kind of connect you on a couple pieces here. Um, there's two special things about the announcements form that are different from any of the other discussion forms that you might put into your class. So one of them is that by default, um, the announcement forum actually forces subscription. So basically what that means is that any time um, a post is made to the announcements forum, students and actually anybody who's enrolled in the course, so that would be students, instructors, um, program office staff, or even our team, um, they're going to get an email copy of that particular announcement. So there's a bit of redundancy built in there, which is really, really handy, especially when you're trying to convey those really important pieces. Um, the second thing that's uh, very special about the announcements forum is that um, only course administrators have access to post to it, which is really great because since it's for subscription, if you had everybody posting in there, you'd get crazy amounts of spam. So when I say course administrators, I'm talking about um, anybody who is instructing the course, um, people from the learning engagement office, so we'll use the announcements forum to post things about e-class outages and things like that. Um, and the program offices may also have, you know, certain things that they want to communicate to students. So things like graduation deadlines and things like that. So um, there's a couple of cool features that I kind of want to show you. So even if you've been using eClass for a while, um, you may learn something new here. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to add a new topic. So um, as you may be familiar with, anything that is marked with a red asterisk is something that is required in order to proceed. So here we're just going to type in welcome, um, a message. Um, so the text editor that you see in eClass is going to be consistent throughout um, the program. And one thing that people do miss is that there's actually a whole bunch more options available here. So if you click the very first button, um, that'll give you a ton more editing options. So you can go in there and you can bold, um, you can color your text, uh, you can highlight things, so on and so forth. So if you didn't know that those editing capabilities were available, um, those can be really, really handy. Um, there are a couple of other things that I kind of want to point out here that might be new to people, even if you've been using eFast for a while. One of them is this pinned. So the other thing I should mention is if you ever see this little green circle, um, if you click on that, that'll actually give you a little bit more information about that particular feature in eClass. So in this case, if I pin this particular announcement, regardless of how many um, discussion posts or announcements I make in this particular forum, that pinned discussion post is always going to appear at the very, very top. So that can be really, really useful if um, at the beginning of term, you want to provide students with, if you need help with this, contact these folks. If you need help with this, you know, contact these folks, things like that. There's also an option for adding to the mail queue now. So by default, um, once you've actually posted to a discussion forum, you have up to 30 minutes um, before it enters the mail queue in which to enter, um, you have, sorry, you have up to 30 minutes to edit um, before that particular posting enters the mail queue and it is you know, sent out to everybody who subscribed to that forum. If you are very confident that there's nothing that you want to change in that particular discussion posting, um, you can choose to add to the mail queue now, um, which means that that 30 minutes is kind of rescinded, but it'll go out as soon as it possibly can. So that's kind of a cool feature there. The last thing um, that I think is heavily underused, um, but is wildly, wildly helpful, is this display period. And this basically gives instructors the opportunity to compose your announcements now and then send them later. So for example, if you have a bunch of time available at the very beginning of your course, 
and you, you know, you usually have an announcement that you send out <coughs> to, um, at the beginning of module one, <coughs> module two, module three, module four, and so forth. You can compose that all at the very beginning of the course, and then um, have eClass, you know, display them at certain points later on in the course. So if you're looking to enable that, um, you do have to make sure that you hit enable first, um, and then that will open up your options here. Um, they do allow you to put a display in, but admittedly, I'm not entirely sure why you would want to do that. Um, keep in mind that students will also get email copies of everything, so it's not like you're taking away an announcement. It will always exist somewhere, and that's going to be in your student's email boxes. So here we're going to post it to the forum. Uh, and so you can see a couple of visual indicators here. So you'll see this little pin, um, and that's just to kind of say, hey, this is pinned. So actually, just a quick example again to show you what this looks like. Okay. So even though um, I posted this one more recently, that pinned announcement is always going to be at the top. So just something to be in, uh, to have in mind. Um, You'll also see that there is a little calendar icon there. And if you hover over that, that essentially tells you that this particular announcement has been scheduled to you know, be released later on. And Rush. Uh, so if you want to pin subsequent items, you have to unpin the previous one? Um, I would recommend doing that, yeah. Um, so to do that, you would essentially just go back um, into your announcement. And you would click the Edit button. And then it would just be a matter of deselecting pinned here and then saving changes. And then when we go back um, to the announcements forum, you'll see that its order has kind of gone back to where it would have originally been. Okay. So um, that's pretty much it for the announcements forum. Again, if you literally use nothing else in eClass, um, definitely make use of the announcements forum. It's a very powerful tool, um, and it's a great way to kind of um, communicate with your students. Um, if you do need to correspond um, with students on a more individual basis, you know, let's say that there's issues with grades or things like that, um, if you go into the participants uh, area, um, you will also have a list of all the participants in the course, and email addresses are listed there as well. So um, you can copy their email address into an email and do it that way. eClass does have a built-in messaging tool, um, but I always discourage people from using it. And the reason for that is you can actually modify your notifications um, for the eClass messaging tool. So for example, I myself, um, because we want everybody to go to leolearn at ualberta.ca, I make it so that people can't actually contact me in eClass. So your students have the ability to do that too. So if you're relying on that as kind of your communication method, you do run the risk of some students not getting the information that you're wanting them to get. So um, the next thing I really want to quickly go over, and I know I'm running out of time. I'm really bad for going over time, I apologize. <clears throat> I have so much to share, so much, so much to share. Okay. So um, in some cases, you're going to want to you know, have more than just uh, a syllabus and announcements form in your course. So I'm not going to go into any of these kind of activities in detail, but I do want you to know that there are a whole bunch of different tools that do exist. So if you're looking to add anything to eClass, um, I'm already in editing mode, um, but you'll want to go to the top right hand corner and turn editing on. If you do not have the turn editing on button, um, it just means that you don't have editing capabilities in your particular course. And so if you do want to make changes, um, just contact Leo or your program office and we can kind of work with you to make sure that anything that you want to add to your course package is made available. So once you turn editing on, um, you'll notice that there are um, add an activity or resource links um, in each of the topics in the class. So if you click on one of those links, uh, you'll see this drop down menu um, pop up here. So in this particular interface, um, all the tools that you can add to eClass are broken down into activities and resources at the bottom. So when you're kind of figuring out what exactly it is that you're looking to do, activities are going to be anything in eClass that students can interact with. So they're going to be posting to a discussion forum. They're going to be submitting an assignment. They're going to be completing an eClass quiz, you know, things like that. Um, whereas with things like resources, these are going to be different ways in which you can actually provide students with information. So um, books um, is not a commonly used one, but files and URLs um, are very, very commonly uh, used. 
Um, you have probably noticed as soon as you click on something, you will get a bit of a description as to what that resource will actually do for you in EFLAP. Um, and oftentimes at the bottom there, it will actually give you some use cases. So for example, um, a file, you might be wanting to upload things like lecture slides, um, you might have assignment templates or worksheets that you want your students to print out and use uh, in the course of their studies, those kinds of things. Um, so yeah, so in terms of resources, um, things that people commonly use are the file resources um, and URLs, but this label one is very, very highly looked over. Um, and labels can be fantastic um, to use in eClass because they allow you to actually put a bit of an organizational structure. Um, behind all of the things that you have in eClass. So instead of, so for example, um, I have this kind of course content area uh, with an example of a label. So instead of saying this is a label, I would perhaps put something like lecture slides. And that makes it a little bit easier to kind of say, okay, well these are going to be all the lecture slides. As opposed to if I removed this and didn't have a label in the first place, um, it just becomes a big mix. Um, and it's a little bit harder for students to actually drill down and find what they're actually looking for. So use labels. Labels are fantastic. Um, the other cool thing about labels is um, you can use custom HTML and CSS and all those kinds of things. And if you're not familiar with those things, that's okay. Um, everybody on the Leo team is, so if you're looking for something a little bit more fancy, something that um, really grabs your students' attention, you can uh, come see us. We can kind of figure out what exactly it is that you're looking for. Um, and we can kind of make that happen. A couple of other things um, that I think are really, really important to highlight here as well um, is uh, the assignment tool in eClass. So in the past, we've had instructors who have kind of said, okay, well, I'm just having everybody email me their submissions, or you know, I'm just having everybody you know, give me a paper copy um, in class. Um, the eClass assignment tool is fabulous because it allows you to have all of your students submit those assignments in the online environment which means that you don't have to worry about losing anything out of your briefcase, um, which is nice. Um, and it also allows you to assign grades, provide feedback, and return all of that to your students as well. Um, I could probably do a four-hour session on just assignments alone, but just to know that they exist and that there's a lot that you can do with them is really great to know. Um, there are also forums. Um, so this is a really great way for you to promote interaction um, student to instructor as well as students to students. That's a really key part of it as well, especially in the online learning environments. Um, and then lastly, um, again, there's so much more than this, um, but quizzes are a really big one too. A lot of people are still um, administering quizzes face-to-face uh, -face on paper, but the really terrible thing about that is you have to take that stack of papers back and you have to grade each one of those individually. Whereas if you use the eClass quiz tool, um, you can automate that entire process. Um, you can put in multiple choice questions, there's short answer questions, there's all kinds of things like that. And then you also get the added benefit of it automatically puts the grade in the gradebook, and there's gradebook magic that happens. Um, your program office staff can access all of that information. Uh, we can run analytics on the quiz questions and how they're performing. There's, there's, there's so much power there. So, I would definitely encourage you, if you haven't uh, already, just to kind of click through each of these tools, just to kind of see what they're all about. Um, and if you have questions, come talk to us. We can talk about what's currently existing in your course and what other kinds of tools we might want to look at incorporating. The very last thing I want to talk about <clears throat> has to do with monitoring course forums. So forums are all great, um, but you don't want to have to be in a situation where you need to log into the course you know, three or four times to a day just to kind of see, oh, did someone post something? Um, usually they haven't. So to have some sort of notification system built in um, can be really, really handy. So here um, I have set up um, a discussion forum. Basically, just like a Q&A, a really good kind of forum to have in your course. A lot of students, generally what we find is if one student has a question, more will. So if a student can post a question into this kind of forum, you can answer it as an instructor and everyone will have access um, to the answer. So to make it so that you don't have to log in uh, to the course and check out the forum every time, you want to set up um, a subscription for yourself. So to do that, you'll come into the discussion forum. There is a little actions gear at the top here. And you'll want to go down to subscribe to this forum. And I promise you this alone will save you massive amounts of time. 
Um, you'll know that you have subscribed when you see this message at the top. And then you'll also see um, next to your discussion posts, um, but there's a little envelope that says click here to unsubscribe. Um, so this just makes it, this is one of those kind of handy tools that you may not have known about, uh, just to make your life a little bit easier. And with that, I am super sorry. I'm going to throw it over to Alex because I'm way over time. Um, if you have questions or you want to set up some sort of consultation with us, we love to do that. Um, we really love to connect with our instructors. Um, LeoLearnAtAlberta.ca. Um, and if you have, um, if you're looking for kind of more self-guided things, we also have tutorials on our website as well. And with that, thank you very much. And I will pass it over to Alex. So to reward you all for staying until the end, you've saved the sexiest topic for the last. So let's talk about file management. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, Alex. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> okay, so it's an honest moment. Who here is afraid of Google Drive? Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, right. Um, so. The big thing about Google Drive is that instead of using local storage, it uses cloud storage. Does anybody want to, anybody feel confident in answering what the big difference between those two is? Cloud storage goes to a general server and you can access it from different yeah. devices. Yeah, the big advantage with that is so local storage usually means like it's a physical thing that you can hold in your hands. It's right here. It's the flash drive in my pocket. It's the hard drive in this computer. It's, you know where it is, you can access it. If it gets run over by a bus or catches fire, it's just gone. Cloud storage, however, is it's somewhere online or in some, you need, you know, or in some unique cases, it's somewhere that's accessible locally, but still it's available to a bunch of people from a bunch of different places. So the big advantage of that is the bunch of people in a bunch of different places. Any questions about that so far? Okay, it's a reasonably, you know, at this point, easy concept, but man, 15 years ago, you remember having to send a 26 megabyte file and having to drive to another person's place to do that? Yes. Yeah. It's amazing how quickly I forget what that was like. I'm a millennial, so I sort of remember that, but I'm like, man, high school students these days, no idea. So a couple quick, couple quick terms. So G Suite, formerly known as Google Apps, it's a suite of tools involving Gmail, Calendar, Drive, Docs, Sheets, and a whole bunch of other things. So this is similar to the Microsoft Office Suite and similar to Apple iWork. So if you're like, hey, it's, these things apply to the G Suite tools, it's any of those things. There's also Google Drive, so like we talked, it's the cloud-based file storage and synchronization service. So as it means, a bunch of people can access it. You can access it from essentially anywhere. And uh, similar to like OneDrive, Dropbox, Apple iCloud. And there's also Google Docs. And I want to make it very clear, Google Docs is a part of G Suite. It's not the same thing as Google Drive. So if you contact us and you're like, hey, I'm having a problem accessing Google Docs, but you mean Google Drive, it will cause a bunch of confusion at first. Hence why I've got that here. So yeah, it's a word processor. Any confusion so far? Cool, well, yeah, it's not that scary. So, <clears throat> they recently introduced something. So there's my drive and there's shared drives. Is anybody like, I've never heard of shared drives before? No, okay, cool. So there's my drive, which is the original Google Drive. It's the, hey, I've got you know, access to a bunch of shared folders. You can, files and folders, they're owned by individual people. They can be shared with groups, individuals. And you can set, hey, how much can people do with these sort of things? Um, so this is really handy because you can say, hey, you know, um, Sharon, Steve, and Susan, they can all edit this thing, but Stan and Steven can only do it. And that can be really handy. Um, there's only one My Drive per Google account, and this includes, well, this includes files and folders shared with you. Quick note there, a folder that is shared with you is not the same thing as a shared drive, which yeah, I know. <laughs> so folders shared with you may or may not look the same as they do to other people. And there's a decent chance you've come across this, but I'm just going to do a quick, really quick demo here. So 
here I have a folder with five documents. But, blah, 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 blah. What did I call this folder? So hey, if somebody's shared something with you, it'll show up in shared with me, or it, and it can sometimes also show up in my drive. Uh, but shared with me is the place where anything that you haven't personally put in your drive is where stuff's going to show up. We also have a priority and priority section up here, and that's where Google is trying to figure out through a bunch of AI and guesswork as to what sort of things you frequently go to. Uh, Okay, we have missing files. The folder itself is shared with both of these users, but not all of the files are. And our user on the right here has no idea that there are files missing. Has anybody run into this before? Yeah, right? You have no idea. Yeah, exactly. Maybe. Is that because you didn't give the permissions for Exactly. For, uh, yeah. Documents A, D, and E are all shared with LeoLearn. In fact, you can see right there. Documents B and C are not. And there is no easy way besides individually checking to make sure that these are always going to be accessible to these people. Whenever you create something new inside of a folder, it just automatically takes all the same permissions as that folder. So if I create a new file here, it'll pop up in LeoLearn because this folder is shared with that. But sometimes internet gremlins happen and things go missing. And <clears throat> another problem is only the owner of a file can change who owns it. Does anybody know why this can be an issue? Have we got nodding over there? Do you want to? Yeah. And like that makes sense intuitively. You're like, hey, if I made this file, it is now my file, and I have rights to this file forever. But what happens if you leave? Yeah. Share those you can't. Yeah, you can. You can change who owns the file, and you can only do that individually at a time. There's no way to say, hey, everything. I'm no longer in this organization. Just pass it off. I'm sure probably all of us have tens if not hundreds of thousands of files that are ours and will be forever. So, so I have a question. So my students will submit a whole bunch of case studies through eClass that I grade electronically. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm grading those, let's say I get half of them and get run over by my course and can't grade the rest of them, should I be can I share those files somewhere so that they can pick up, another instructor can pick up on the ones that I've already graded and continue on with the rest of that class? So, things that are submitted through eClass are not part of the G Suite of Tools. Of course it is. Yeah. So we don't run into this problem at all, which is nice. Okay. Yeah. So we won't have this, we can't, don't need to do this in eClass. Um, yeah, the, the idea of file ownership, it only it's only an issue specifically to Google Drive. Okay. But if you're anything like me, once I changed to my current position, I was still getting phone calls from my job. I was still getting emails from my previous job for a year being yeah. like, hey, you're still the owner of these files. Can yeah, you please transfer them over? Yeah. yeah. That's why they create mm -hmm. yeah, and that's why they created something called shared drives. So shared drives were rolled out August of a couple years ago, and what they are is instead of individuals owning things, the drive itself owns things. Now, this is really helpful for team situations, like we have a Leo shared drive, which means anything that gets created in there, it's owned there. You can add and remove people real easy from that. But if one of us, you know, one of us leaves, finds a better, finds greener pastures, that sort of thing, it's not as big of an issue. Well, like one of us retires. It could happen. Amanda's like getting there. 
<laughs> Brian's going to be here forever. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, man is sitting on a sweet nest egg. Brian keeps sending his kids to sports. I think it's real <laughs> expensive. But one of the drawbacks of the shared drive is you can't share folders. You can only share files. It's two separate ways of thinking that are almost the same, but are very much not. And it's, yeah, it's a thing. But like I said, it's easy to add and remove users from this. And everyone who's part of the drive will always be able to see everything that's in there. There is no, oh, you have only access to some of these files. That's not a thing. So it's not a really big confusing concept, but it can be really handy in that sort of a scenario. Any questions about that? Cool. All right. Who's still afraid of Google Drive? Yeah. There's a bunch of fun things in there. So I wanted to talk a little bit as well about... Revision history. Revision history is boring, but Jesus is necessary at times. And the things that are boring but really necessary I find oddly exciting because I'm an old man. <laughs> so here we have a document with updates. Um, who knows how to check what the updates are? Who knows how to check what happened? Yeah. That's it. That's it. Okay. Yeah, so we can we can actually really easily tell when the last edit was because it just says right up here at the top. Last edit was two hours ago because Alex is on top of his demos. And we can even go back and we can say, hey, what was the previous version? If it'll load, oh, it just says nothing. Uh -huh. So it says nothing because the document was created and then we decided for a change. But if we click this little arrow here, it'll show us some more things. So because there was only one person making edits to this, that's not that exciting. But if you have a document that's changing hands a whole bunch of times, it can be really handy to know, hey, who changed what things? When did they change them? And if you want, you can also name your different versions. So if you're the type of person who's very used to being like, this is syllabus version 23, this is a handy way to do this in Google Drive so you don't have 23 different files. But if you really like Word, you can do this with other types of documents as well. It's just a little bit hidden. So that was a right click, and then we can check out Manage Versions. So if you upload a file to Google Drive in a folder that's got something in the same name, even if it's like Document with Updates 1, Google will automatically be like, hey, do you want to just stack these? Which can be a really handy way of, once again, keeping track of your 23 different versions of your syllabus. I get that this isn't that sexy, but it could be really handy. <laughs> cool. Any questions? All right. I got one last little tidbit, and then I'm going to call it. This is something that they just recently added, which I'm unreasonably excited about because I have a lot of spreadsheets in my life. Who else has a lot of spreadsheets in their life? Yeah, it's just the Leo team. OK, that's cool. <laughs> uh, they recently added edit history on cells which is really nice if you want to say, hey, who changed this cell, and when did they do that, and what did it previously say? This can be really helpful if you have a spreadsheet that says, hey, here's, for example, with us, the status of these 800 different courses you're, su you're supporting this term. And you're like, when did somebody change the due date of our own stuff? That's how you do it. It's just a simple right-click, edit history. OK, so that was a quick and dirty look at Google Drive. We've got. Like I said, my drive, which is, which is where you'll have your stuff as well as things that are shared with you. And those things that are shared with you are not the same as shared drives, previously known as team drives. They changed that. I don't know why. And shared drives, what can be really handy is make a whole bunch of these. If you're like, these six people I always work with, but I also always work with these 13 people in a different capacity, just make two different drives. OK. Um, Anybody have any questions? Anybody like, hey, this thing's always bugged me about Google Drive? Cool. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for, for coming, everybody. Um, I hope you learned something new.
We also will have a, a newsletter that goes out as well. I'm not sure if you've seen it come through your emails. I kind of give you a little bit more information what's going on with us and the faculty, so check that out. Um, we'll also be offering more of these kind of workshops throughout the term, so we'd love to see you all out there at those as well. So that's all our pizza on the way out if you want. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.